Thank you for coming. Welcome to Copyright 101, which is an introduction to the third type of intellectual property. I'm Cheryl Overheiser, librarian and representative of the Patent and Trademark Resource Center, or PTRC, at the Free Library of Philadelphia and past fellow at the United States Patent and Trademark Office, or USPTO, from 2017 to 2018. Um, we're going to be recording this presentation and we'll send the recording to you plus the slides after the presentation. Um, please put your questions in the chat and we'll stop periodically to answer the questions. I'm joined by my co-host, Brick Department Supervisor Jillian. Thank you, Jillian. As I mentioned in the last slide, the Free Library of Philadelphia is a PTRC, a Patent and Trademark Resource Center. What is that? We're one of 83 libraries in the US and its territories designated by the United States Patent and Trademark Office, USPTO, in Alexandria, Virginia, as a resource for patent and trademark information um, for the public. The Free Library of Philadelphia has been a PTRC since 1986. Here's a picture of our beautiful brick spray space on the ground floor of the Parkway Central Library in Central Philadelphia, where the PTRC and other brick uh, resources are located. Um, BRIC means Business Resource and Innovation Center. The PTRC's main focus is on patent and trademark information, but we also include learning resources for copyrights and trade secrets like this class. We provide information, but not legal advice since we're librarians and not attorneys. Um, the BRIC also has services for nonprofits, job seekers, and businesses, so please check us out. Let's talk about intellectual property or IP as it's known, patents, trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets are all intellectual property, which are protections for what you invent or create. The type of IP you use depends on what you create. What do the four types of IP protect? Patents, protect your inventions. Trademarks, protect your business brand like your brand name, logo, or slogan. Copyrights protect your artistic creations like a song, poem, book, blog, photo, painting, or movie, and more, which we will get into. And trade secrets protect your business secrets like a secret sauce recipe, customer list, production methods, or even inventions, okay? We're gonna talk about the third type of intellectual property, copyrights, which are handled by the Copyright Office, which is part of the Library of Congress. The website for copyrights is copyright.gov. Copyrights protect artistic works, like I just mentioned, um, and also includes pictures, sound recordings, computer code, and architectural works. Copyrights are cheaper than patents or trademarks. The cost starts at $45, and it takes three to nine months on average to receive your copyright. The copyright term is generally the life of the author plus 70 years. Works created before 1978 or works for hire will have different copyright terms, however, but the general is the life of the author plus 70 years. So these are all the things that can be protected with copyright. So here's a list of uh, some of them. However, what is not protected by copyright? Because this is important to know also. Copyright does not protect ideas, procedures, methods, systems, processes, concepts, principles, or discoveries. Works that are not fixed in tangible form are not protected like by copyright, um, such as a choreographic work that it's not, has not been nota uh, notated or recorded, or an improv speech that has not been written down. Also, titles, names, short phrases, and slogans are not covered by copyright. Also, familiar symbols or designs like the peace sign or symbols on the keyboard. Um, also, variations of uh, typographic ornamentation, lettering or coloring, and also mere listings of ingredients or contents. So I'm going to provide additional examples later on in the presentation, but this is in general what is not protected by copyright. Okay, here's the definition of copyright. Copyright is a form of protection grounded in the U.S. Constitution and granted by law for original works of authorship fixed in a tangible medium of expression. Copyright covers both published and unpublished works. Oops, sorry. Um, 
So let's break down that copyright definition because sometimes definitions are sort of boring, but um, it's important and we'll break it down what each part means. So an original work of authorship is a work that's independently created by a human author and possesses at least some minimum degree of creativity. Things that have a minimum degree a degree of creativity are things like photographs, painting, books, or blog posts. Things that don't uh, possess a minimum degree of creativity are things like merely lists, like a phone book or a recipe. Yes, unfortunately, a mere list of ingredients is not considered to possess the minimum degree of creativity required. So you likely can't copyright your biscuit recipe. However, a collection of recipes in a cookbook can likely receive copyright registration. Okay, all right, this is the next part of the definition, fixed in a man, uh, tangible medium of expression. A work is fixed when it's captured in sufficiently permanent medium so that a work can be perceived, reproduced, or communicated for more than a short time. So what does that mean? It means a recording, audio or video, something that's in print, saved in a computer file, a drawing. There's even a movement notation um, system that can record choreography. Writing in the sand or singing your original song in your car is not considered a tangible medium of expression. Okay, copyright protection in the United States exists automatically from the moment the original work of authorship is fixed. So this is important. You do not have to apply for copyright registration to have copyright rights. Um, here's an example of a copyright notation right here um, that you can use to show that you're claiming copyright rights even without registration. It's a small C in the circle with the year of publication and your name. Even though you're not required to use copyright notation, it can be a good idea because it can make people aware that the copyright, a copyright is claimed on your work. In the case of a published work, a notice might prevent a defendant in a copyright infringement case from trying to limit or his or her liability based on an innocent infringement defense. This means that the person is claiming they didn't know that the work was protected by copyright. Copyright notices identify the copyright owner at the time that the work was first published. For parties, people seeking permission for the copyrighted work to be used, that notice identifies your first publication, which may be used to determine the term of the copyright. Also, notice might prevent a copyrighted work from becoming an orphan. An orphan work is a work whose owner is impossible, by, impossible to identify or contact. So contact notice is a quick and um, easy way uh, to show that you're claiming copyright rights and it can give you a lot of ben benefits. Okay, how long does copyright last? In general, and I mentioned this before, for works created on or after January 1st, 1978, the term of the copyright is the life of the author plus 70 years after the author's death. If the work is a joint work with multiple authors, the term lasts 70 years after the last surviving author's death. For works for hire, anonymous or pseudonymous works, the duration of the copyright is 95 years from publication, or 120 years from creation, whichever is shorter. Okay, what are the rights of the copyright owner? Um, the copyright owner can reproduce the work, prepare derivative works, which is a work that's based or derived from one or more already existing works. Common derivative works are like translations, musical arrangements, motion picture versions of literary material or plays, art reproductions, abridgments, and a condensation of pre-existing works, like kind of like Reader's Digest. Uh, my mother-in-law used to read those, you know, condensed versions of a work. Um, another type of uh, derivative work is a new edition of a pre-existing work. Um, Performing, distributing, and displaying the work to the public are rights of the copyright holder. The copyright holder can also authorize others to um, exercise these rights as 
in a licensing agreement. So the copyright holder can authorize other people to use the copyrighted work in agreement for uh, in exchange for payments or like a licensing agreement. Okay. All right. So why should I bother to register um, uh, my copyright when I get all these rights just by fixing my creation. So why should I bother to go to the trouble and money to register with a copyright office? If you register your copyright at copyright.gov, there will be a public record of your ownership and you're gonna be able to file for an infringement case in court if someone infringes on your copyright. Registration will also allow for damage it, damages payments, attorney fees and costs to the copyright owner. And you can also file with the US Customs and Border Protection against um, people trying to import counterfeit uh, materials of your copyrighted work. Okay, so how do I register my copyright? So to apply for a copyright, go to copyright.gov. So as I mentioned, this was a part of the Library of Congress. Um, the U.S. is different than a lot of other countries. Most other countries have like a one-stop shop for intellectual property registration. The U.S. is different. Patents and trademarks at the, are at the United States Patent and Trademark Office or USPTO. Copyright is at the Library of Congress. So it's a little bit different because they're separate. So here is a picture of the home page of um, copyright gov. If you hover over the law and policy where the blue arrow is, there are circulars here which are helpful three to four page guides on every part of the copyright process. So here is the circular page. Um, you, there are over 70 different circulars on a whole range of copyright topics. And here are some of a uh, few of them. So these are really great it's like a quick and dirty um, um, synopsis of everything, uh, the main things you need to know about the copyright process. Um, so here's examples of a few of them. Copyright basics is number one. Um, website and website content is circular 66. Works not protected by copyright um, 33 that goes into more detail than I did. How to get permission to use a copyrighted uh, work, international copyright relations, copyright registration for pictures, graphics, and sculpture works, and also three different circulars on musical com compositions and sound recordings. If you scroll a little ways um, on the homepage, you're going to see these sections. They're uh, um, especially going to be concerned with registering your work, and that's where you're going to go to actually apply to register your works, to apply for your copyright. Once you click on register your works, you're going to go to this page to find sections for six different types of copyrights that you can apply for. Literary works, performing arts, visual arts, and other, uh, other digital content, motion pictures, and photographs. There are a lot of helpful videos and tutorials to help you um, in the process. They're going to have copies of um, the application form so you can um, see what they're going to ask you for and there's videos that walk you through on how to do the process. Okay, how long does it take to get a copyright? Probably on average four-ish months, but it can be anywhere from two months to more than a year depending on the complexity of the copyright. Applying online for a single work with a single author, not for hire, is the shortest amount of processing time. Um, as you can see, so here it is, claims that do not require um, correspondence average 1.1 month. And this is going down. Like uh, I reviewed this from a couple of months ago when I did this and it was back in December, it was 1.4 months. So they shortened it up. So it's an average of uh, 1.1 months for them to turn around um, with an online application, single author, um, not for hire is pretty short. Okay, claims with correspondence a little bit longer. Um, here it is, um, mail forms down here, um, submission is 8.3 months. So, um, as you can see, paper applications sent through the mail take a lot longer than an online application and it's cheaper too. So you can apply with a physical 
uh, form and send it in, but it's going to cost longer and it's going to be uh, more expensive too. Okay, so here are the fees. Um, the cheapest is um, $45. Um, as you can see here, the paper filing is $125. So you're going to save yourself a lot of money um, and time if you apply online as opposed to paper filing. If you, you can, if you want, um, but just so you know, be going and you're going to save money and time by applying online. Um, so you can just take it. This is the first top of it, but you can see the fees depend on whether it's an online application, how many authors, and how many works submitted. Um, a, a detailed explanation of the copyright fees are covered in depth in circular number four. Okay. Do I send a copy of my work to the copyright office when I register? Yes. You have to send a deposit of your work. One copy of your Un, unpublished work and two copies if it's published if, um, to register your work. Um, a deposit can be sent electronically um, and your deposit becomes part of the property of the Library of Congress. So you have to send copies and then they keep them. Um, okay, all right. Um, just like patents and trademarks, there is no international uh, copyright per se, but treaties can help you protect your trademark rights around the world. Um, there's something called the Berne Convention that has 179 countries in it, and they've all agreed as part of this treaty to honor other countries' copyrights with certain minimum, minimums. Notably, you don't even have to register the copyright in your home country to be eligible, eligible for this protection. And so this, well, I thought this was really cool when I first found that out. So you get international uh, copyright rights through the Berne Convention with 100, almost 180 countries without even registering with a um, uh, copyright.gov in the United States. You only have to have it fixed in tangible form. Um, some of the countries um, in the Berne Convention don't protect um, as long. The US is the life of the author plus 70 years. Some countries in the Berne Convention will only provide up to the life of the author plus 50 years, but that's still pretty long. Um, please check the country's laws that you're interested in. There's a very helpful circular at copyright.gov called Circular 38A, International Copyright Relations, um, of the United States that you might want to look at. So um, here is a map of the countries that are party to the Berne Convention. So you can see it's like the vast majority of the world um, is in the treaty with the Berne Convention for copyrights. Okay, then let's next talk about questions that are commonly asked about copyrights. Okay, one of them is, can I copyright my book title? No, unfortunately, as you can see here, and you might've noticed when you go to amazon.com, book titles are not copyrighted and are frequently exactly the same, which can cause confusion. So I like to read, uh, if someone might say, oh, I read this great book and they uh, would tell you, oh, it's called Early Warning. But if I went to Amazon, I would be like, well, is it this one or is it this one? There's uh, another two, exact same, hold still and hold still. So um, you cannot copyright your book title. However, you can trademark a book series. So you can see here three different book series that have been trademarked like um, The Adventures of Stushy and Bello. This one, The Oxford Tea Room Mystery. So um, this, um, can be copyrighted Ox from uh, Oxford Tea Room Mystery. So you can see it's book number five, but it has its own title, Muffins and Morning Tea, okay? And also this one, the Bellador series, okay? So no copyright for book titles, but you can trademark a book series. Um, another frequently asked question is, can I copyright my domain name? No, unfortunately, um, but if you remember from the slide at the beginning, names cannot be copyrighted, but the original work of authorship on the website um, can be protected by copyright, like your writings or blog posts, artwork, photographs, and other forms of authorship. 
So procedures for registering the contents of a website are found in Circular 66. Um, and you can find out more information about this. And you can decide how often, if you want to register copyright for your um, website, you want to do it once a year, um, you know, once a month, that's up to you. Um, so, all right. Okay, so far we've covered copywriting um, your works, but what if you want to use someone else's copyrighted work? How do you do that? Um, you can find the copyright holder and negotiate a licensing agreement with them. If you're having trouble finding the copyright holder of the work that you want to use, you can ask the copyright office to help you research to find the copyright owner. However, they might charge you a fee for this service. So for more information about this, the circular number 22, how to investigate the copyright status of a work. Okay. Um, so exceptions and limitations to copyrights. Do you always have to comp contact the copyright holder to use copyrighted works? Not necessarily. If the work is in the public domain, anyone can use it freely without permission. There's also a fair use exception to copyright, and that is for the purposes of education, research, reviews, parody, and news reporting. However, um, you don't have carte blanche to do this. There are some determining factors um, in using copyrighted work under the fair use exception. It depends on the purpose and character of the, character of the work you're gonna use, the nature of the copyrighted work, the amount and, uh, of use of the copyrighted um, uh, document. Are you planning to use a little or a lot? Um, if you're using a lot of it, that, you know, there might be a problem with that. Also, the effect of your use upon the potential market value. So there are no hard and fast rules under these uh, determining factors of fair use. And that's why there are frequently disagreements and they end up in court cases. Also, works for hire are an exception to copyright in its terms and ownership. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So let's get uh, more specific. Um, about these limitations and exceptions to copyright. So let's start with works in the public domain. Works in the public domain have copyrights that are expired. Currently, everything published before December 31st, 1926 is in the public domain. A work might also be in the public domain if the copyright owner failed to follow copyright renewal rules or copyright notice rules that were in place for works between 1927 and 1987. So there used to be a lot of different rules, a mishmash of things you're required to do um, in the past. So it makes it a little bit more difficult to determine whether or not a copyright is in force for older works. Um, so also things are in the public domain if the copyright owner deliberately placed it in the public domain or dedicated it to the public domain. So there's a really good review of public domain under fair use at stanford.edu and the next slide. Okay. All right, so as I mentioned, for copyrights between 1927 and 1978, the copyright laws were different. And here's a, a good chart from Cornell University that can help you determine whether a copyright during this period is still enforced. Um, laws for copyrights before 1978 varied and some copyright um, laws in the past required a copyright notice to be displayed to be legitimate. So at one point they said, well, if you didn't display a copyright notice, you don't have copyright. Um, and also some copyrights had to be renewed for some period. So um, it makes it difficult. So you can see here, here's a chart that can help you determine um, whether something is in the public domain or is still covered by copyright. Um, so um, um, so it means that in, you know, in general, that some copyrighted material may also be in the public domain, even though it was created after uh, 1926. Okay, also exempted from copyright rules are instances that are deemed fair use, which are commentary, limited educational use, and parodies, uh, which makes fun of the copyrighted work. 
Um, so parodies, makes fun of the work, are considered fair use, but not satire. So that's kind of a fine line. Here's an example of a parody from Weird Al Yankovic of the Nirvana um, and, uh, album, Smells Like Teen Spirit. So his parody was Smells Like Nirvana. Um, it's a parody making fun of the original work, which is permitted, but satire is not. As I just mentioned, satire is using a protected work to make fun of another thing. Um, so that's satire and is not covered under fair use, okay? All right, this is a good time to talk about a famous copyright case that illustrates some of the copyright principles I just talked about. So this is Naruto, a seven-year-old crested black macaque who lives in an animal sanctuary in Indonesia. In um, 2011, a British photographer named David Slater went to the animal sanctuary in Indonesia to photograph the animals. The macaque seemed interested in the camera and uh, in his camera and by the clicking sound it made. So Slater left his camera in a clearing near the macaques and waited to see what would happen. Surprisingly, Naruto started taking pictures of himself. And this is one of his self portraits that he took using Slater's camera. And here is the most famous of his selfies, a close up where he's smiling like crazy into the camera. So this monkey selfie went viral on the internet. Wikipedia created an article for it and displayed this close up picture of Naruto, his selfie, with the caption that the photo was in the public domain in terms of copyright rights. The photographer, David Slater, asked Wikipedia to remove the photo, saying it wasn't in the public domain and that they were infringing on his copyright. He said that he had a copyright on this, that he had copyright rights. Wikipedia refused to do what Slater asked, saying that no copyright exists since the creator was not a human. So if you remember, the definition of copyright in the US is created by a human author, okay? A court case was brought by PETA uh, people for the ethical treatment of animals on behalf of Naruto, claiming that Naruto owned the copyright and furthermore, he should get licensing fees for his use. The courts determined that no copyright existed for either Naruto or Mr. Slater. Um, and also that Naruto being an animal had no standing to bring a case to court in the first place. So, Wikipedia is still displaying Naruto's selfie in their article, Monkey Selfie Copyright Dispute. So if you Google that, Monkey Selfie Copyright Dispute, um, and you can see, read more about it. And the photo, this photo is there labeled as being in the public domain. Despite the court ruling, Mr. Slater did agree to give a portion of the sales of his book that he wrote um, with Naruto's selfies in it. He's agreed to give a portion of the proceeds from his book to the animal sanctuary. So um, as far as I could tell from uh, my re research that Naruto is still there in the animal sanctuary um, in Indonesia, living a good life. All right, uh, let's talk more about works for hire and copyright. If a person creates material for pay for another person or entity, the copyright is not held by the creator, but rather the party that hired the individual. Um, the, the party that hired the individual is considered the author and the copyright owner of the work. So if you have someone creating something for you who works for you, make it clear that you are the owner of the copyright to avoid running into trouble down the road. Okay. So here's some helpful books and websites available on the internet and through the Free Library of Philadelphia. Um, the Philadelphia, the Free Library of Philadelphia LinkedIn Learning Base also has some really helpful free online courses about copyright along with other related topics. Okay, so here are some copyright courses available on LinkedIn Learning, at which you can access um, on at freelibrary.org with your library card um, that you can use for free. So just need your library card and PIN. Um, the copyright uh, for creatives protecting your work um, is by a graphic artist. And he talks about how he has dealt with copyright and infringement to his copyright 
uh, material. So he, this is very helpful. He has a five-step process. Um, um, and I think steps one through three are doing it himself. And then only to steps four or five, if he's not getting results, does he refer to an attorney? So I think this is, um, you know, a really helpful video. Um, also, if you're interested in music, the um, music law copywriting course um, is also very helpful. And then Richard Stim um, um, does some of these courses, who's also written many books on intellectual property and is very knowledgeable. So um, take a look at LinkedIn Learning and put copyright in the search box and you can find some free, very valuable information about copyright because copyright uh, law is, is complicated. All right, uh, what about an attorney for your copyright protections? You don't have to have one, but if you want one, you can explore uh, these legal resources for the Philadelphia area and beyond. Um, so you can go to the local bar association and ask for, um, uh, referrals for a copyright uh, attorney or ask your friends or um, if money is an issue because attorneys are expensive, you might qualify for free um, or pro bono legal resources for help. Uh, Philadelphia Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts will help you. Um, they service the greater Philadelphia area um, and they can help artists um, for their intellectual property needs. Um, also, Philadelphia VIP is a help. Um, also, businesses must be within um, Philadelphia. Um, and if you're not a nonprofit, it's income based. Also, the Free Live, I mean, the University of Pennsylvania Law School um, takes on clients every August and January. Um, you actually become a client with a um, student attorney and with, the over, uh, with a professor overseeing. Um, uh, your interaction with them. And also there's law school clinics around the US um, that you can see at this link that might be able to help you. Some of the law school clinics um, are location-based like um, the University of Pennsylvania helps people in Pennsylvania. Um, so you can find one specific to your area if you're not from Pennsylvania or the Philadelphia area. Um, some of these law schools also though are not location-based. They'll help anyone um, uh, within the U.S. if you qualify. Okay, unfortunately, I have to talk a little bit about scams. Please check out the reputation of any promoters or requests for money. Um, unscrupulous people might try to take advantage of you and either charge you a lot of money for things you could easily do yourself for free. They might outright steal your money or you might not get the type of IP protection that is most useful for you. So just be careful before you um, spend your money about who you're paying it to. Okay, um, we're kind of breezing through here. So um, thank you for coming and we have time for questions. So please ask away. Any questions? Hey, Cheryl, we don't have any questions in the chat, but feel free if you have something, type it in. Um, and I'm happy to read those off. Great. Yeah, we don't have, um, you know, we didn't, we still have a lot more time left. So ask away, don't feel shy. Um, we're going to send you a copy of the recording and um, the slides, and um, you can ask questions. Now, if you would prefer to have an appointment, um, you can go to freelibrary.org forward slash patents and request a one-on-one -on -one appointment. It'll be a Zoom appointment with just uh, uh, me and you or, or any of your um, you know, work associates that have questions. Or you can send, if you just have a quick question, to brick at freelibrary.org. Um, so um, the one-on-ones will be via Zoom, like I said, take about 45 minutes or less if you, you know, uh, you don't have that much uh, to ask. Uh, free, of course. So we're here to um, answer questions. If you can't answer it, we'll try to refer you to someone who can. We can't uh, give legal advice, unfortunately. Legal advice is like counseling you. Like we can't tell you, oh, you should do this or you should do that. Uh, but we can give information and direct you to people that um, can answer your question, even if we can't.
All right, we have a question in the chat. Um, Sandy asks, can you copyright stickers with Bible quotes? Um, hmm. Let me think. If it's a Bible quote, I would say it's in the public domain. Um, it depends. Let me think about this. I would say Bible quotes are in the public domain. And if it's acting as a trademark, you might need to um, apply for a trademark if it's a business identifier. So that's the short answer. Um, I would say it depends. Um, you know, if it's identifying your business on the sticker, um, you know, there's something about it that identifies your business it might be trademark eligible. And like I said, I think Bible quotes are in the public domain. Okay, and Gregory asks, can something be trademarked that is similar, but a little different from another intellectual property? Um, trademarks, um, like I said, are business identifiers. They protect your business and the consumers. So they know where your product is coming from. Um, so a trademark isn't necessarily a, um, a business identifier. So could you like clarify and I might be able to help you more. Um, I can take another question while um, he's elaborating. Is there another one? Nothing yet. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, Gregory just added, um, it's an event. Okay, so a trademark, if you're like an event, event a promoter, um, a trademark could identify your business. Um, if you have an event and people are singing songs um, that they've written, they would have the copyright on that. Um, if um, people are performing um, um, or if it's recorded, you could get copyright on that. But, you know, just copywriting an event, um, probably not. But if, like I said, um, if you were uh, a promoter, um, you could get maybe a trademark on your business. So I'm just guessing, I mean, I don't, you know, as best as I can tell, I can't tell you for sure without um, letting you know if you want to make an appointment, we could talk about it further. Um, or um, you could go to USPTO.gov and read a little bit about trademarks um, that could help you determine a little bit better whether a trademark is, is uh, right for you. And go to copyright.gov and take a look at that too. And that can help you decide what kind of intellectual property you need. So that's the thing is you have to decide before you apply um, for a patent or a trademark. Um, you know, they, they, you know, they won't just, you can't just send it in and they you know, said, oh, well, this is part of this trademark. This is a patent. Um, so you, I would recommend reading more about patents and copyrights and making an appointment and I can help you um, get information to, to make your choice. Gregory said he's going to make a call and read through that material. Um, I do want to preface that by saying Parkway Central Library is experiencing some phone difficulties right now. Um, so I recommend requesting an appointment through our website, um, which is freelibrary.org slash patents here on the screen. And I dropped a link in the chat. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, so I think if there's no other questions, we can wrap it up. Thank you for your good questions. Thank you for coming. Um, and um, I, we hope to see you again at another event at um, in the Business Resource and Innovation Center or BRIC at the Free Library of Philadelphia. So thanks so much and we'll end here. Thanks, bye-bye.